turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for the worship that has been had. And Father, I pray that now as we get into your word, that you would take us even deeper. We read in John that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus, and he was the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. And so, Father, as we read your word this morning, I pray that we would see Jesus. And if that happens, we'll give you glory because it won't happen without you. Holy Spirit, would you come and move, move in and through our weaknesses, move in spite of our weaknesses. Um, Father, take the things that are weighing heavy on our mind and be strong on our behalf this morning. Father, would you give us the strength just to give our cares to you so that we can allow you to care for us this morning as we open your word together. We just commit this time to you. It, it belongs to you. This is your word, your church, your day. So we, we give it to you and thank you for the opportunity to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 6. This morning we're looking at verses 5 through 15 where Jesus talks about prayer. Books and books and books have been written on the subject of prayer. And so there is so very much that could be preached on this, this topic. It's, you might say it, it's, the, it's the lifeline of a believer is prayer. Jesus died in a sense to make prayer possible. He tore the veil that separated us from God so that we would have access to God. So, um, so very much could be said about prayer. My dad one time told me, I was reading books on prayer, and my dad encouraged me. He said, Jeremiah, it's good to read prayer. But he said, at the end of the day, you can read all the books that are written on prayer, and at some point, you just got to pray. So a lot of guys get good at preaching on prayer and reading on prayer and having Bible study on prayer that don't ever pray. And so that always stuck with me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus says, and when you pray, doesn't say if you pray, doesn't say that you should pray, he assumes that you as a Christian will be a prayer. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, the play actors. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they will be heard by their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. We are going to, growing up, I'd go to my cousin's place in Wisconsin and they had a bunch of apple trees. There's two different ways you can get apples. You can just walk underneath the apple tree and pick the apples that are right there available. Or you can get a ladder and climb up and pick the apples that are higher up. This morning, we're just going to walk around this text and grab the apples that are right in front of us. You can grab a ladder on your own time and glean a whole lot more apples on prayer. This morning, we're just going to pick what is right here in front of us. The first thing, Christians will be people who pray. Why? Because Christ prayed, and that's what Christian means. Somebody who follows Christ literally means little Christ or Christ-like. That's what Christian means. So you say, I'm a Christian, then you will be somebody who prays because Christ prayed. What is prayer? I'm going to give you just the rock bottom base definition of prayer, and that is talking I should have given a survey and seen how you answered that question. What is prayer? I think most of us would initially gravitate toward the definition of talking to God. And I would suggest that the definition of prayer is talking with God. It's listening to him as he speaks through his word. This is where God communicates with you. If you sometimes feel like you're talking to a wall and and you're not hearing from God. Elizabeth and I were watching a movie last night where one of the characters was frustrated that God never talked to him. This is where he's going to speak. If you don't live in this book, you're not going to hear God speak. The Holy Spirit was the, is who God sent here to remind us of His words. That's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring to your memory things that you've heard from God in here. And so you're in a tough situation and you're needing God to speak to you. If, you, if you're not living in this book, you're not going to hear Him. I'll just tell you right now, you won't hear God speak. This is where He speaks. Why doesn't God ever talk to me? Because you never listen. So we listen to him as he speaks through his word, and then we talk to him about his word. And we talk to him about our life. That's the communication. God speaks, we listen, and then we speak, and, and God listens. Number two, prayer is meant to be seen by God, not men. Verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the play actors or the pray actors. I just came up with that now. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues. That's the, they love that prayer. They love to, so be like where I'm standing. This is their favorite place to pray where people hear them pray. And they love to pray on the street corners. That, and that's a huge word in this verse, that they may be seen by men. Jesus is not condemning public prayer. He is condemning hypocritical prayer. Often in the Bible, you read group prayer. So what we do here, you read that often in the Bible. And Jesus participated. He doesn't condemn that. He condemns those who, this is where they look forward to praying so that people hear their prayer. It's a hypocritical prayer. 
You don't really care about being heard by God, and that's what prayer is all about. You don't really care about that. You care about other people hearing you talk to God. That's what Jesus is condemning. He says, pray to be seen by God. He is calling for us to pursue intimacy with God. Write that word down if you're taking notes. Somewhere in your Bible, somewhere on your bulletin, intimacy. This is the kind of prayer Jesus is calling for. Look at what he says. This is, this is intimate language. Verse 6, when you pray, go into your bedroom. Go into your room. Shut the door and pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Go into your room, shut the door, and be seen by God. That sounds like marriage to me. Go into your room, shut the door, and be seen by God. You might, my favorite definition of intimacy is when you break it down into three words. Into me see. Love that definition. See into me. That's the kind of prayer Jesus is calling for. Don't, don't pray to be seen by other people. You're going to be rewarded. They're going to see you. They're going to hear you. And they might think big spiritual things about you. And that's it though. That's your reward. You don't get anything more. Pray to be seen by God. So you shut the door. It's just you and God. And he sees into you. You see into him. It's an intimate kind of a prayer that Jesus is calling for us to have. And then he says, number three, think when you pray. Verse seven, and when you pray, do not use vain, worthless, empty repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they will be heard for their many words. This is a works-based kind of a prayer. So God isn't hearing me because of my heart. God is hearing me because I'm using lots of words, impressive words. So it's as if I'm working to earn God's ear. Jesus says that, that, that doesn't work that way. Do not be like them, he says in verse 8. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. Think when you pray. Don't just be an answering machine when you and God are communicating. (laughs) Hello, God, you've reached the automatic prayer of Jeremiah Canope. I would like to thank you for this day, for my family, friends, and food. Please keep us all safe and healthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Think, Jesus says, when you pray. A lot of us will start our prayer by saying, Lord. Do you know what that means? If you don't, I'd figure out what it means before you use that in your prayer. Heavenly Father. What does that mean? Why do I say that? In Jesus' name. What does that even mean? When I close my prayer with, in Jesus' name, what am I saying? Can I reword that in a different way? If you can't reword Lord in a different way, I wouldn't use it because you don't know what it means. If you don't know what most Heavenly Father means or Heavenly Father, I wouldn't use it. Or I'd figure out what it means that you're, what you're saying. In Jesus' name, what does that mean? Amen. Do we even know what amen means? We just know. I just know that's the period. I'm done. Conversation's over. Amen. That's not what it means. Well, so what does amen mean? If you don't know, I just encourage you, maybe think about looking up what it means before you, you say that. Because it doesn't mean end of conversation. Why does it not mean end of conversation? Because throughout the rest of the New Testament, Jesus says, pray all the time and never stop. Pray without ceasing. So if we say amen, and that means end of conversation, that's unbiblical. 
I think many of our prayers, mine very much included, would be aptly called maple syrup prayers. Minnesota, my next door neighbors, make maple syrup. And it takes approximately 50 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. My friends hate making maple syrup. A lot of work for very little. When you take all the sap that you've collected and you boil it down to what's actually usable, you have very little. I think probably most of our American prayers are like that. If you take all the words that we're throwing out to God and you boil it down to what's actually coming from our mind, we know what it means, and coming from our heart, there's, there's probably very, very little left in most of our prayers. We're just praying things that we've been praying since we were five years old, using words that we hear the pastor using or our favorite speaker or whatever, and you boil it down, and, and I wonder, I just wonder how much prayer is left. So think, Jesus says, when you pray, just use your mind. Think about the words that you pray. Number four, Jesus says, I'll give you a model. Use this prayer as a model. He doesn't say, this is the prayer you need to pray. Pray this word for word. Now, many of our religions or denominations have grabbed a hold of this prayer and said, this is this is prayer. These words right here. That's not what Jesus says. Now, it's okay to pray the Lord's Prayer word for word. It's, it's more than okay. You're, you're praying Bible, which is exactly what Jesus is calling us to do. But that's not the point of this prayer here. Jesus doesn't say, these are the words you need to say. He says, this is how I would have you pray. Like this. And... To do that this morning, I just want to engage the questions. The journalist is always asking who, what, where, when, why, how. First of all, who? Jesus says, verse 9, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Pray like you're talking to your dad. Maybe you're here and you didn't have a good earthly experience with your dad. Your father is in heaven, meaning he's not like your earthly dad. He is better than your earthly dad. Maybe you had a great earthly dad. God is not like your great earthly dad. He is better. He is your father who is in heaven. Jesus says, pray and this is different than, now, it's okay to use all different kinds of words. In fact, that makes you think, and so I would say biblically that's healthy. You can pray to your creator, and you can start out that way. And I think that's healthy, biblically healthy. You can pray to your maker, pray to your Lord, which means, I'll just tell you now, it means boss. That's what Lord means. So, dear boss, that's okay. That's who God is. You can pray to your boss, your master, your creator, your king, or your God. But when Jesus teaches on prayer, all of these things are who God is. But he says, use in your mind, use the aspect of God being your father. Pray, not like you're coming to your boss, but like you're going to your father. Pray, not like you're going to your creator, but like you're going to your daddy. And he is your daddy who is in heaven, meaning he's perfect. He's perfect in love, not like your earthly dad. Father on earth, father in heaven, very different fathers. A father in heaven is perfect in love because heaven is perfect. The father in heaven is absolute in power. The father in heaven sees a bigger picture. If you, if you think of it in physical terms, father is in heaven See, he sees the whole picture. And you can just think in physical terms because he's high up. And so he can see everything that's going on. I'm just speaking in, in physical terms. And he sees all the things that we don't see. 
He sees a bigger picture. All we see is a car crash, God the Father, and we go, why the car crash? I don't see, but God the Father does, because he's in heaven. Why did my house burn down? I don't understand, but the Father in heaven is going, I do. I do understand. Why did my family member die? Why did I get this farm injury? Why did I lose a loved one? Why am I dealing with such emotional trauma? I don't see why. So then, pray to your Father who is in heaven, because he does see why. And you see this over and over throughout the Bible. Job, his life turned upside down. Job says, I don't see why. At the end of the book, he understood, I don't have to see why. My Father in heaven sees why. Elisha's servant, I love that story in the book of Kings, where they're surrounded by the Syrian army, and all Elisha's servant could see was the bad guys. And so he goes to his, the prophet Elisha, and he says, We're gonna, today's it. Today's the day we die. And Elisha prays, Lord, would you open his eyes? And God did that. He opened the servant's eyes and he saw, what did he see? Somebody tell me what the servant saw. Army of angels. Chariots of fire surrounding the mountain. So our father, that's why he says, pray to your father, because that's the character that we, he wants to develop in our prayers and not just to any father, but to your father who is in heaven. And then there's the what. That's who, what. What do I pray about? Number one, there's, there's several answers to the what. But the first answer, what do I pray about? Pray about God, for starters. This will rock your, your whole prayer life if you get in this habit. What do I pray about? What do I start my prayers with? Jesus says, when you pray, pray to your Father in heaven and start your prayers about God. That's where you start. All of you have that friend who loves to talk about themselves. All of you have that friend who, when you're talking on the phone or in person, they just love to talk about themselves, the happenings in their life, the joys in their life, the struggles that are going on in their life, the plans they have for their life, their ideas, their venting, whatever. You have these friends who just love to talk about themselves. And if you don't have that friend, you're probably that friend. <laughs> I, you don't need to name drop, Sarah. We just and Sarah can attest to this. It's draining on a relationship. Right? When the conversation is all about them. It's draining on a relationship. Me this, me that, please. Me. And Jesus says, it doesn't change when you're talking with God. Don't just talk about yourself, because this is a relationship too. This is what it is. God is not your Santa Claus. He is your Father who wants to have a relationship with you. And so when it's, God, me this, me that, me please, if, if it's draining here, why do we think it's not draining here? Jesus says, don't, don't start with you. No relationship wants to hear all about you, including your relationship with God. Look what he says, verse 9. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So underline your name. The next words, your kingdom come. So don't tell God about your kingdom and the things you want for your kingdom. Talk about God's kingdom. Don't talk about your plans. Verse 10, your will be done. Look at how prayer starts. Your name, your kingdom, your will. And this is both a praise and a prayer request. On the surface, it's praise. Your name is holy. And name means his character. So who you are, God, is holy. It's perfect. It's set apart. It's totally different. It's lifted up. It's nothing like here. You're good. That's who you are. That's your name. You're good. You are always with me. 
You are my provider, Jehovah Jireh. That's who you are. So you focus on his name, and that'll change your whole prayers. You start your prayers by reminiscing who God is. It changes the rest of it. Say you're going to go to God, and you've just got, um, I don't know, finances seem to always get us. So a, a huge bill coming up that you can't afford. If you start by God, this is my need, this is the way I feel, all of a sudden, right off the bat, it's focused on you, and that prayer is not going to get very far at all. You start your prayer by going, God, I know who you are. You're faithful, even when we're faithless. That's straight out of the Bible. I know that you are the God who sees. That's straight out of the Bible. I know that you will never leave me and never forsake me. That's straight out of the Bible. I know you have said if I trust in you with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding, but I acknowledge you in all my ways like I'm doing right now, you will direct my steps or my path. That's straight out of the Bible. God, I know who you are and I'm coming to you because I know who you are, Daddy. So now i got this need. This is to change your whole prayer. That's the praise, and then that's also the prayer. Make your name holy in me. If, if, if you are comfortable marking in your Bible, write the words in me, and then draw a line to hallowed be your name, draw a line to your kingdom come, and draw a line to your will be done in me. Because something you'll notice, if you, if you climb that ladder this week and you pick some apples higher up, you're going to read verses like Matthew 10, 7, where Jesus says, my kingdom has come. So why would I be asking God for his kingdom to come if his kingdom has already come? Because I'm asking, this is a personal relationship. Close the door, shut the door, and it's just us. So God, your kingdom come in me. You be king in my life. Your kingdom's come, I know that, but you be king in my heart. You set up your throne in my heart. Your will be done. You've already told me throughout the whole Bible that your will is going to be done. So, let it be done in me. Make me excited about your will. So it's a praise and it's a prayer. Why do we pray that way? If you don't have... I'm. <laughs> If you don't have the New King James Version of the Bible, you, you're going to be missing the end of verse 13. I'm not going to get into it, but my wife is laughing and glaring at me right now. You, so your, your version's fine, okay? And, and the reason your version is fine is because at the bottom of the page, you're going to have a little footnote that says some versions include this text. Draw a circle around that text and, and write a note that says, this is in the Bible. Look at how verse 13 ends. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And here's, here's what does amen mean? To close the door? No, because he keeps praying. So, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. And then amen means, does anybody know? All of those are different ways of saying the same thing. It is right. It is true. So be it. This is the way it is. That's what amen means. So, most of you can use that word, it sounds like. Yeah. This is true. For yours is the kingdom. So, why do I pray that way? Jesus says, start your prayer by saying, God, it's all about you in this world. Make it all about you in my heart. Why do I pray that way? Because it's all about God. It, is, it isn't about me. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. The what? It's all about God. Why? Because it's all about God. For yours is the kingdom. It's about, for yours is the power. For yours is the glory forever. Amen. It is true. What number two? First, what? What number one? Pray about God. What number two? Then, secondly, after you've talked about God, talk about you. And there's all sorts of verses in the Bible that might encourage you here. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, We cast our cares on God. Why? Because He wants to care for us. 
He loves it when we cast care on him, which means I talk about myself. God, this is my struggle. God, I'm really wrestling this right now. I don't love my pastor. I don't even like my pastor. God, I'm casting this care on you. You got to help me. Whatever it is your struggle is. Because he loves to care for us. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary or weak and heavy laden. Do that. Come to me with your weariness. Come to me with your weakness, and I want to give you rest. Matthew 21, 22, he says, Ask. Just ask. So cast. Come. <laughs> come cast. That's how I would word that in my Bible. That's, I just came up with that one now, too. Come cast. That's the kind of prayers he wants. Tell him about your needs. Tell him about your wants. Tell him about your hopes and your plans and your concerns. Why? Because verse 8 says he knows all those things already. You're not telling him anything he doesn't already know. He says, I already know what you have need of before you ask. So let's talk about it. None of it's a surprise to me. Nothing you tell me is going to catch me off guard. Nothing, you tell me, is going to catch me off guard. If you have self-sabotaging feelings toward God, you're angry with God, you're frustrated with God or whatever, it's not a surprise to him. He knows this. So tell him, God, this is what I'm... I don't, I don't get this, or I'm frustrated about this, or God, if I'm honest, I'm angry about this right now. He already knows. So he says, let's, let's, let's talk. Tell him about your needs. It glorifies him to no end when we unload on him. We acknowledge our dependence on him. He loves that. It, it glorifies him. We exalt him by saying, God, I need you. It doesn't make God happy when you, when you need him for something, but you don't want to bother him about your sin, or you don't want to bother him about whatever. So you, you need him, but you try to do it all on your own without him. That doesn't glorify him. When you say, God, I need you right now, that glorifies him. It lifts him up as being the one who is the provider. For your needs. There's a pastor one time, I think this is a true story, who was eating with a, a buddy at a cafe, and they get their meal and they sit down, and the pastor bows his head and he thanks the Lord for the food. And he gets done, and his buddy says, What, what are you doing? He says, I was thanking the Lord for my food. And he says, Oh, I, I never do that. He said, uh, I work hard, it's my money, so when I get my food, I just dig right in. And the pastor said, Yeah, my dog does the same thing. Get the food and just dig right in. Say, God, thank you. I, I wouldn't have this without you. When do we pray? Or when are we praying for? Who, what, where, when, why, what's the when? I would, I would encourage you that verse 11 says the when. The answer for that is pray about today. Not tomorrow's needs. Not the needs of next week. Not the needs of next fall. When you're praying, pray about today. Pray for now. Because what that does is that, that fosters a contentment in our heart. Because I'm not worried about tomorrow. Right now I'm just engaging God about what's going on today. Give us, not tomorrow, our daily bread. Which is what our culture teaches. Are you ready for retirement? then you need to get ready for retirement because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And, and Jesus says, <laughs> God does. So why are you worrying about tomorrow? I'm not saying to plan for retirement is wrong. Jesus is talking about prayer here. And he says, when you're praying, focus on the things of today. I can't help but wonder in my own life, if I spent less time living in the future and more time living in the present, the moment, or today, how much more powerful my life would be? I just wondered that. Because if my energy, you know, today, my energy is split between today, tomorrow, next week, and next fall, 
I've got a fourth of that energy for today. If my energy was today, God, I'm praying about today. My focus is on today. My heart is set here on today, on you. I know who you are. Here's the things I'm going through. We've had this time together. And so, God, I'm just asking for these things today. I wonder, I don't know, I don't have an answer to this, but I just wonder how much more powerful our day-to-day life would be if our energies in prayer were focused on today. What, number three, this is the last what, and that is pray about relationships. This is an apple that's, in a lot of ways, way up at the top of the tree if you really want to get into it. Pray about relationships. Verse 12, so you're praying about God, then you pray about yourself, and now you're venturing out and you're praying about relationships. And I think, That is the biblical model for prayer. Start by talking about God and then pray about yourself because you can't be of any benefit to anybody else if you've not filled yourself up with God first. And we've already preached on that in years past. So pray about God, pray about yourself, and then when that relationship has been prayed for, then pray for your relationships with other people. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts, As we forgive our debtors. The first relationship here that you're praying for is your relationship with God. And the second is with people. Every, check this and see if this is true. Every relationship that humans experience. Yeah. Every relationship. Every. Every relationship that humans experience experience depends on forgiveness to function i think that's absolutely true every relationship that humans experience depends on forgiveness to function i would say there is no such thing as a relationship void of forgiveness because Humans make mistakes in every relationship you're a part of. We make mistakes in our marriage, and so if our marriage is to function and to thrive, there needs to be forgiveness. We make mistakes in our church, and so if our church is to have any unity whatsoever, there's got to be forgiveness, because all of us are making mistakes, so all of us need forgiveness. In a parent-child relationship, Both are making mistakes. Both need forgiveness. Friend, boss, employee, whatever. If forgiveness is present, any relationship can thrive. And so when Jesus teaches us to pray about relationships, it's it's no incidental thing that he said pray about forgiveness. If you have forgiveness... Any relationship has the possibility of thriving. If you don't have forgiveness, forget about praying for the relationship because there isn't going to be one. He goes to the root of what every relationship has to have to function, and that is forgiveness. And he says, pray about forgiveness. And the implications here, you've got to climb up that ladder, are huge. Verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses... Your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. (laughs) Heaven is only a place for people who have been forgiven. You don't go to heaven if you've not been forgiven. And Jesus says, if you don't forgive other people, you won't be forgiven. I just... So, if you are not a person who forgives, fill in that blank. You go, well, that sounds like works to me. If I don't forgive... 
I screw up my opportunity for heaven? What does Jesus mean when he says this? Again, this, this, this really requires a, a full sermon just in and of itself. But people who are forgiven practice forgiveness. If you have been forgiven, if you're a forgiven person, you will be a person who practices forgiveness. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says. It's in Matthew chapter 18 verse 21 through 22. Forgiven hearts forgive. If you're taking notes and you want a short little deal. Forgiven hearts forgive. If you don't forgive, it's just evidence that Jesus is not living in your heart because if Jesus is living in your heart, Jesus even on the cross, right? Don't this is even on the cross is Jesus is hanging there. What does he pray for people? He says, "Father, for, forgive them." That was his dying prayer. Is that we would be a forgiven people. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That was his dying prayer. And so if Jesus lives inside of your heart and has set up a throne in your heart and he is abiding in you, you cannot help but be a forgiving person. Now there's a lot that we could talk about forgiveness and what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. If you... Don't forgive people. I would draw a huge question mark by those verses and spend time today, shut the door, get in the room, and spend time with Jesus. Our heavenly relationship is intimately linked to our earthly relationships. And that's why there's forgive our debts. This is this relationship as we forgive our debtors. If our relationship with our Father is good, it will be evidenced here. You will have forgiving relationships here. If our relationship with people here is strained, it will affect our relationship with God. They're very much interconnected. Let me just close this with a verse, and then we'll, then we'll end with the last question. But, but if you're taking notes, ponder this one this week. 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. I'm going to read this one for you. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God, that's what they say. And hates his brother. That person is a liar. 1 Corinthians 13, what does love do? Love, that whole chapter basically says love forgives. Love bears long, love suffers long, love does not hold grudges, love, etc., etc. What is love? Love is forgiveness. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must Love his brother also. You can't be unforgiving towards your brother and say that you love God. That's what, in, a, in, in the short, the apple's right here. That's what Jesus is saying about forgiveness. And then finally, the question is how? So we know what we're praying for. We're praying for our God and our relationship with God. We're praying for other people. How, how is it that our prayers get answered. And that's verse 13. Jesus says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You can reword that to say the same thing, but reword it to say, Father, you lead us. You lead. That's what I would do in my Bible. Taking notes, I would say, Father, you lead. You lead my heart. Because any other leader in my heart is only going to lead me into temptation. Any other leader is going to lead me into pride. 
If culture leads my heart, it's going to lead my heart into so many temptations. It's going to tempt me to be prideful. It's going to tempt me to be selfish. It's going to tempt me to lust. It's going to tempt me to be angry and discontent and dissatisfied. If any other leader takes residence in my heart, it's going to lead me into all sorts of temptations. So, Father, you lead. Because if you lead, it will not be into temptation. Because your word says that. God tempts no one, James chapter 1. God tempts no one. So you're not asking God not to tempt you. What you're doing is asking God to lead. Because if he leads, temptation isn't going to be coming from the leader of your heart. When the Father leads, he's going to lead you into patience, into hope. He's going to lead you into love and sacrifice and humility and joy and supernatural peace. Father in heaven, I just I thank you so much that we can come to you as a daddy. That we can come to you as a daddy who is perfect. Your love for us is perfect. Your forgiveness for us is full and everlasting. Your power to actually answer our prayers is infinite. When we ask our dads for things, sometimes they can come through and sometimes they can't. That's not the case with you. You are... Father, I pray that as a church we would come to you more and more often as a daddy. And Father, I pray for our relationships with you as individuals, that we would be people who pursue intimacy with our Father in heaven, and that we would be a people who model forgiveness in our marriages and in our church and in our workplaces and with our kids and with our parents and Father, may forgiveness reign in the communities of Chalk Hills, for it is all about you, this world. We have been forgiven by you, so may that motivate our forgiveness for others. And Father, would you lead? Don't let me lead. Don't let the leadership of Chalk Hills be the ones who lead our hearts. Don't let the president lead. Don't let our culture lead. Father, would you, through your spirit, be the leader of our hearts and teach us to pray in Jesus' name. Amen.